Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today's lesson is about alternative splicing. Now first let's talk about what just regular splicing is. Splicing is a post-transcriptional process in which introns are removed and exons are joined together. What does this mean? This means that in a pre-mRNA transcript that's made in the process of transcription in the eukaryotic cell, there are introns, which are non-coding regions, exons, which are coding regions. The introns get spliced out. This can confuse students because in versus out, but in stands for intervening sequence, X and the exon stands for expressed sequence. So it's the exons that are joined together into the mature transcript. Now, alternative splicing is a regulated process where there are multiple protein isoforms that can come from the same pre-mRNA transcript. So these multiple protein isoforms are encoded by a single gene uh, via exons, parts or exons or introns being differentially joined or skipped. Now let's look at a picture of this. Right here, we have a, an mRNA transcript. It needs to be spliced. The exons are the parts that have different colored patterns, so, and, and the white portions are the introns. So the introns get spliced out. Some of them are degraded. Some of them are, so some of them have regulatory processes, which we'll touch on in just a minute. But the exons, you see there's four exons here, and in this example, they can be differentially joined or skipped, differential. This is one of the reasons why a synonym of alternative splicing is differential splicing, but they can be joined or skipped in different ways. So for example, in this, in this isoform, we have this exon, this exon, and this exon, but this one has been skipped. In this isoform, we have this exon, this exon, and this exon, but this one has been skipped. So in alternative splicing, you have situations where multiple protein isoforms, like two shown here and often even more than two, can be encoded by a single gene. And this occurs because exons or even different parts of exons or introns can be joined or skipped in different ways, resulting in a lot of different combinations. So this isoform and this isoform, remember that these are still uh, mRNA transcripts. They have not been translated into protein yet, but they do code for different proteins now because this mRNA transcript and this mRNA transcript have different sequences. The fact that they have different sequences means that once they are translated uh, at the ribosome into protein, those proteins have different structures. Now the structures can be related. For example, they both have this component here. They both have this component here, although in this one they're separated, in this one they're together. This one has a different component at the front. So they've, they've got different structures, related structures, but certainly with differences. And these different structures can lead to different functions. And so you can have these different protein isoforms that are all from the same gene, but because of alternative splicing, they can carry out different functions in the cell. Now, I also wanna take a minute to talk about the fact that in humans, as many as 95% of multi-exonic genes, that means genes that have more than one exon in the transcript, so 95% of multi-exonic genes are alternatively spliced. So this process is a very, very common one in most eukaryotes, including humans. And the really great thing about alternative splicing is that it very, very much increases the diversity of proteins encoded by the genome. Because you can get completely, uh, you can get proteins that, while they might have related structures, they have different functions, all coming from the same gene. And this is why when the human genome was first, uh, first sequenced by the Human Genome Project, 
scientists were very, very surprised, shocked to find that such a small portion of the human genome actually codes for proteins. And so much of the rest of the genome is regulatory DNA. Some people will call it junk DNA, but we know now that that's not really true. And, and people thought, well, if such a small portion of the human genome codes for proteins, how do we get so many proteins? And then we learned about alternative splicing and suddenly it all made sense. Let's talk just very briefly about the mechanism of alternative splicing. It is highly, highly regulated. It's not something that just sort of goes off randomly. It is regulated in part by sequences within the mRNA transcript. I said earlier that when these introns get spliced out, sometimes they're degraded, but other times the introns themselves, which are just a sequence of nucleotides, can be highly regulatory. They can inform other components acting in this mechanism on how to act, where to cut, where to join. Also, there are various proteins that play a role, specifically two types of proteins. The first are activator proteins. The second are repressor proteins. And these do what you might think. The, the activator proteins activate certain aspects. The repressor proteins repress certain aspects. And this controls which places get cut, which places get skipped, which places get joined. And also a major component of this process is a large complex of RNA and protein that work together. This complex is called the spliceosome. And the spliceosome works along with the, the activator proteins which activate it, repressor proteins which repress it, to go and cut in the right places and join in the right places to get these different transcripts that eventually lead to the different protein isoforms. So that is it for this video on alternative splicing. If you're interested in learning about post-transcriptional modifications like regular splicing, also five prime capping, the three prime poly A tail, please see my video on the post-transcriptional modification of mRNA. And that's it for today. Thank you for watching.